Welcome to this uh, webinar, a closer look at montane acid grassland. Um, montane acid grassland being the um, the name of the this sort of subtype, this fine scale habitat. Um, there's a reason for me specifying that because because of the use of the word montane. Um, if we can go on to the next page. This is Rachel doing the paging, by the way, because our um, bandwidth here is is relatively low and it's more complicated and more tricky if I try and do it from my end. So um, a brief outline of, um, of what this is going to be. Definition, the main plant species, definition of the habitat, main plant species we find in it, and um, floristic variation within it. All looking simply laid out there on a photograph of what looks like a fairly simple looking um, bit of a landscape with some acid grassland. Things are never as simple as they seem, are they? Um, here's, an, here's another sort of introductory page, which is not the one in the uh, MPMS sort of um, official type of design. It's one in which I've just put a wee, wee bit of blurb. That's the sort of blurb that I wrote a few months ago um, for the um, advertisement about this um, these sessions. Um, and uh, with another picture of some montane acid grassland. Um, and making a note there of the fact that there will be a fair amount of overlap between what's in this session and what was in the one last year and also the year before, looking at um, the sort of rather broader upland grassland habitats in general, which part was acid and part was more calcareous. Okay, uh, we can go on to the next, um, next page and um, thinking about definition of the habitat. Um, the word montane, it's quite important to understand really what is meant by the word montane, because if you take it in the in the sort of more strict sense, uh, ecologically, climatically strict sense, then that would imply that by um, by saying montane acid grassland, that we'd be talking about things actually in the true montane zone, which tends to be pretty high up uh, places where where the climate is, is pretty cold and severe to such a degree that you don't get much of any way of kind of woodland, any kind of bit of montane scrub at the very, very most. Um, that's, that's just a small total extent of land in Britain and Ireland. Um, reading through, as I did, the um, guidelines to the MPMS habitats, it became clear to me that it was actually more general upland acid grassland that's being um, that this, this fine scale habitat is meant to include, because otherwise, if it wasn't, there would be no place in the MPMS scheme for grassland that was, uh, acid grasslands that were of an upland type, but were not strictly montane. So um, the, the montane zone is the most um, severe climate zone um, in, 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 on, on, on at higher altitudes generally, and mainly further north. And it's actually very, very rare in the southern, southern half of Britain. Um, but for this purpose, we're not having to um, really split true montane from uh, upland stuff that isn't montane. Um, if you look on, we go to the next page here, um, and we'll see some maps that um, that I've drawn. The last one, actually, last year I had the kind of map like this. It was in a sort of brown and green mix of colours. This one's a more up-to-date one. I've just done a couple, actually, based on a combination of... Um, how wet the climate is and how cold it is. And those two things merge together to make a sort of climatic, an index of climatic severity, you could call it, um, which picks out the areas of Britain with an upland type of climate. Uh, and upland climate versus lowland climate is not strictly related to altitude because the further south you go, you tend to have to go a bit higher up in altitude to get the climate being sufficiently cold and damp is to be of, of an upland nature. If you're in the far northwest, um, northwest Scotland, Northern Isles, west of Ireland and so on, then you can get that kind of climate right down at sea level. Um, so um, the, the uh, I've done a few little um, notes there to mention also that um, wind is part of it as well. Upland climate tends to be on the whole a little bit more windy and that of course of adds to the um, the severity and the discomfort and also in total you know this kind of climate that is um, being more severe different plant species are better adapted to it um, so we find um, differences in the vegetation between those areas that are colored blue or combined blue and gray and brown in that map compared with those that are colored white which are the more lowland parts of Britain um, 
So if we go on to the next um, next page. Yeah, I'm um, just going to move that over, but I'm also just going to mention that I have made some changes to the chat now. So do feel free to have a little go and, and introduce. If you do still have any problems with the chat box, then as I say, please do feel free to use the Q and A box, not just for questions. There you go. That's great. Thank you. Um, there's some some grasses I'm looking at first um, here, but um, actually one thing I didn't do a couple of pages back is to um, was to just sort of mention what I'd written in coloured writing was that the uh, with regards to definition this is upland generally right, um, and it includes all kinds of upland acid grasslands, but in addition to that it includes some other quite different kinds of vegetation fern dominated um, vegetation like bracken. Um, some vegetation dominated by greater woodrush. There'll be pictures and um, some talk about these in due course here, but and also snow beds and summit heaths, which do have some grasses in them, but a lot of them, are, when you look at them, it's mixtures of other things like mosses and sedges and so on. And uh, a, a lot of vegetation there that if you just looked at it, you wouldn't really think at first that it was a grassland because it isn't really a grassland. But in NPMS terms, it comes within. This, um, this habitat, which is a fine scale habitat in the MPMS classification, but although we call it fine scale, uh, because it's a subdivision of a broader habitat, it's actually quite broad in itself, really. It encompasses quite a lot of different, um, different kinds of habitats, different plant communities and so on. So um, to start with here, um, looking through species, going through uh, a number of the grasses to start with, that uh, as you'd expect, because it's grassland mainly grasslands. Some of the characteristic grasslands of these uh, grass species are upland acid grasslands. Wavy hair grass, um, very, very common one here. It used to be called Des Shamsia flexuosa, by the way, in case some people are confused about the name Avenella. Um, it's it's recent, a recent change of name. It's one of those species of grasses whose leaves are very thin and wiry. There are some more, we'll see some pictures of it because some of those other ones also grow in the upland acid grasslands. Um, when it's in flower, it's really very distinctive though, with those open, airy looking flower heads, which wave about in the wind and the little branches within them, some, in some parts of those are quite wavy. Some couple of reasons there why it can be called wavy hair grass. Um, and um, it can, it's very common across a wide range of um, acid habitats altogether, not just grasslands, but also heaths and woods and bogs, wherever there's an upland, wherever there's a kind of um, acid soil. Um, the next page has um, some more general views of the kind of vegetation in which that grass is really, really abundant. Um, so, so much so that if we were using the National Vegetation Classification, we would call it this, uh, the Avenella grassland. You too. I've made a bit of reference throughout this presentation, by the way, to some of the national vegetation classification communities. Um, I know this isn't strictly MVC, but it kind of maybe helps to highlight that there's such variation here in different diff different little plant communities that that is picked up in the MVC. There's, this fine scale habitat encompasses quite a big range of national vegetation classification plant communities. So yeah, uh, one of which is dominated by the wavy hair grass, and there's a couple of pictures of it. And we often find that this grass comes to dominate um, in places where there's been some disturbance to the acid soil, maybe by burning or by um, sort of felling, clear felling of conifer plantation in the uplands. And um, the dominance of wavy hair grass is very commonly just a temporary thing over a few more years, some other grasses and maybe dwarf shrubs as well can get in there and the wavy hair grass abundance starts to dwindle and it gets more mixed in um, in equal amounts with a lot of other species and you'll get a different community then. So complete swords of wavy hair grass tends to suggest there's been some disturbance there not too long ago maybe and that things might well be changing in the next decade maybe roughly. Okay, um, some more grasses coming up on the next page. Species that are very common in, um, in upland acid grasslands. Common bent. This one is, um, is extremely common. Uh, it's a broader leaf grass. It's got leaves a few millimetres across the leaf blades. And um, a sort of equally sort of airy, you might say, um, inflorescence, but more intricate than that of the wavy hair grass we saw 
just now. It's a kind of, there's lots of little whorls of branches there. It's got a very short little ligule. You know the ligules in, um, in grasses where the leaf blade leaves the top of the leaf sheath. It's that little sticking up projection in most species of grass. And um, in the case of the agrostis genus, the, um, the ligule length can help to separate the common bent agrostis capillaris with a very short ligule from other species such as the, um, the agrostis vinealis, which is very, very common in a lot of the, um, the acid grasslands and acid heaths as well. It's got a longer ligule um, and, and can actually be quite tricky to separate from another species of agrostis, agrostis canina which can also grow in damper acid grasslands and um, upland acid habitats of loads of mires, brush mires and sedge mires and so on. Um, sweet vernal grass is an easy one to tell with that sort of um, narrow oval unbranched looking head with big shiny spikelets on it and rather long hairs around the base of the leaf blade and the leaf blades taste of almonds by the way. It comes up quite early in the year um, but the flower heads do remain after they've gone over they turn that sort of buff um, golden color a bit like the color of the um, that we can see in the sheep's fescue heads in the middle photograph and they tend to remain well into the winter so uh, most times of year you can pick that species out very common in upland acid grasslands then we've got a couple of fescues sheep's fescue and red fescue both of which have very thin wiry leaves at least at the base of the plant in the case of the sheep's fescue, all the leaves are very thin and wiry, like those of the wavy hair grass. But in the case of the red fescue, it's an unusual one because the leaves growing up the stems, which are far less numerous than the leaves at the base of the plant, they are actually um, maybe up to a couple of millimetres or so wide, three millimetres wide, or something like that. And um, so they're a different style of leaf, two different styles on the same plant. Uh, they're, those are both very common in acid grasslands, especially the sheep's fescue, which is a smaller plant, um, shorter leaves and a stem, um, stems are shorter as well, and the inflorescence doesn't open out so widely. Uh, so yeah, very common species there in the acid grasslands. Yorkshire fog is another one, um, especially a kind of acid grassland where there's maybe been a bit of nutrient enrichment. It uh, it does very well where it's a little bit more um, fertile soil. Um, quite distinct with softly hairy leaves and the softly hairy inflorescence as well, which tends to often to have a pinky tinge to it. Um, and the lower leaf sheaths have this stripy pinky purple um, striping on them, hence people call it stripy pajamas. Um, these are all very, very common grasses, all the ones on this page. Uh, and these are all, I've noted there that they're all pretty palatable to large herbivores. Um, and I don't know why it is the common bent and sweet vernal grass are listed as negative indicators in this habitat. They are naturally here. Um, it's, um, and I don't think really there's anything particularly negative about them. They occur all through upland acid grasslands from tops of mountains to the lower altitude ones and you know, a range of different plant communities. Okay, um, next. That's a really good question, Ben. I'll have to chase up with, um, yeah, Ollie and Kevin, I'd be interested. I can't think off the top of my head, but as you say, they're listed as negative. Mm. Um, talking of sheep's fescue, there's another one that looks very similar to sheep's fescue as far as the leaves are concerned, but the flower head's quite different because it's got all these, it's a viviparous flower head with lots of little tiny plantlets growing on it. So it's quite unmistakable. And this is very much an upland um, species of fescue. Um, pretty common, especially in the northern uplands growing with sheep's fescue, vegetative leaves just looks just the same, but with the flower head, um, very, very distinctive characteristic upland species. Um, okay, now um, we've seen a few of those grasses. We can go on to look at a few um, herbs now. Well, two on this page. These are probably about the two commonest little herbs that we can find generally in upland acid grasslands, tormentil and heath bed straw, both very distinctive. Now, tormentil is, um, uh, well, there are other species in that genus with little yellow flowers and leaves divided up into a number of leaflets, but tormentil typically has uh, four petals to a flower and um, three leaflets. And they've got quite relatively big teeth. 
along those leaflets towards the sort of end part of the leaf, quite distinctive little things, and a couple of stipules at the, um, the leaf base as well. Um, heath bed straw, a very low creeping thing with white flowers and little whirls of leaves from about four, just whirls of just four in some of the younger, more poorly developed specimens up to eight in a whirl on, um, on bigger ones. And each leaf has little tiny hairs around its edge that point forwards, um, outwards and a bit forwards. And that's a good way to tell it from some other similar looking um, bed straws like a limestone bed straw, if you were lucky enough to find that uh, on more calcareous soils, that is, and that's got teeth that point backwards on the edges of the leaves. But there are no hairs on the stem on this one, where some of the some some of the other bed straws with uh, white flowers do have hairs, backward pointing hairs on the stems as well as the leaves. So this is about the smoothest of all the small white flowering um, bed straws, and it's really really common on acid soils uh, in a wide range of plant communities, but especially really acid grasslands. And it's one of the key species. Um, for separating acid grasslands from calcareous and neutral grasslands, whether you're in the uplands or the lowlands, actually. Very, very important species for telling um, acid grasslands. Tormentil is most common on acid soils as well, but if you're in the upland parts of Britain, you can't rely on tormentil to say that you're in an acid grassland as opposed to a calcareous or neutral one, because it does also grow in some of the neutral and calcareous grasslands in the hills. Um, not so much in the lowlands. In the lowlands, it's rather more uh, of a strong indicator um, for acid, as is as uh, you like the heath bed straw. Okay, next page. Uh, we've got both of those two herbs growing with um, a number of those grasses that we've just been looking at in uh, a little sort of fairly close view of some typical, you could say, middle of the road acid grassland. Um, absolute typical upland acid grassland has uh, swards of varying mixtures of things like wavy hair grass, the sheep's fescue, the sweet vernal grass and the common bent and maybe bits of the Yorkshire fog as well. Uh, different, uh, different proportions of those things from one place to another. So this is a typical view of that kind of, um, ma mainly the, the, um, the bent grasses, the sweet vernal grass and the fescues especially those ones. So people call it in the MVC, we would call this U4, which is a sort of festuca agrostis, Galium saxatile grassland. Sort of absolutely about the most common kind, the most extensive kind of um, acid grassland. So um, that's a, a view of that. And if we then go on to the next page, this is another kind of acid grassland that's also very common in the uplands, about the next commonest, or in some areas equally common, um, an equally extensive kind of acid, uh, upland acid grassland. And um, this this one is, um, that, that picture on the left shows a whole mass of tussocks of it in this, um, in this upland grassland community in which mat grass, Nardus stricta, is really abundant. And it's another wiry leaved grass, um, but the leaves tend to be massed together in denser little tussocks compared with those previous species of wiry leaf grass that we've seen. And they're a bit of a um, rougher texture and a little bit stiffer. Um, but the thing that would really clinch it for our identification is that if you look down at the base of the shoots, you find that the leaf blade leaves the, um, the, leaf, the top of the leaf sheath um, very market, sort of markedly um, wide angle, almost 90 degrees in some, in some cases. So, um, the, uh, the other feature that it has to identify, of course, is flowers, as with any grass. And when, when flowers come out in the um, late spring, early in the middle of the summer, they're very narrow flower heads, so narrow you can easily miss them. They've got these kind of blackish um, spikes that are held so close to the stem, it's just a sort of blackish looking line. But when, well, that, if, when you do spot it, that's pretty diagnostic. But then when they've, um, when they've gone over, um, the, the, the sort of paler flower heads uh, as they are then have the little little spikes, the little the little flowers bending out to one side. It's been likened to a fishbone, that kind of effect. Um, makes them much more distinctive. And then as the year wears on and you get into the autumn, the leaves themselves go that very pale colour as well. So um, 
you then you then see the view like we have in the lower left photo there of this um, this kind of grassland. This this species of grass, unlike most of the other ones that we've seen in the last few pages, is not very palatable to animals like sheep or deer. Um, it's not surprising because it's incredibly tough textured. If you try and pull a little bit out to, uh, to examine the lower um, parts of the shoot to see if those leaf blades are sticking out like that, it's really tough stuff to pick up. So it's not surprising it's not very palatable. Uh, and what often happens in some places where there's a lot of grazing is that this species of grass can sort of take over because the more palatable species the bent grasses, the fescues, sweet vernal grass, and you know, those kind of grasses get eaten away more and more. And that leaves more space for this thing, for the mat grass to take over. It's a funny thing really, because it's such an incredibly tough textured plant and tough looking. We would think, well, it can hold its own against anything really, but it can't really to hold its own that well against those softer textured grasses, um, unless, something else comes along and suppresses their growth, like grazing. So, um, and in some higher up places, also snow, as we'll see later, there'll be some photos of that. Um, so this uh, ecologically, this is a rather different thing here, this grass that gets to be very common in more gray spaces because it's very unpalatable. Um, okay, next page. So before um, we move on, Ben, I can see we've just had a quick question um, regarding, yeah. Uh, deciding on habitat tap, type there in the uh, chat, if you can read it there. Um, oh, how yeah. do you differentiate, um, what is the definitive factor for deciding on habitat between, say, um, acid um, versus neutral? How do you differentiate, oh yes, I'm seeing it now, how do I differentiate, sweet vernal grass mentioned earlier as a negative indicator of acid grass and versus describing it as neutral grass then, for example, the definitive factor for deciding on the habitat. Um, if it's in the um, if it's in the acid grassland, because you, you can get sweet vernal grass in some neutral grasslands and indeed in some calcareous grasslands, especially in the uplands. A lot of a lot of these grasses go right across the board, you know. Um, so if it's got a lot of um, of the heath bed straw in the sward then that's going to tell you that it's an acid grassland. If it's got a lot of tormentil, that's going to hint as well that it could be an acid grassland, but it won't prove it, you know. Um, if, as we'll see later, if it's got a lot of um, a, a lot of time in it, that will pull you towards calcareous. Um, and then there's another range of other herbs um, like um, red clover and oxide daisy and yellow rattle that are more characteristic of neutral grasslands. So it's really the sort of herbs, um, those species that do the bigger job in differentiating between the acid, neutral and calcareous. Um, so yeah, sweet vernal grass could occur in, um, in all of those. Um, and, and, and in any of them, I, I wouldn't really think of it as being um, a negative indicator anywhere, really, sweet vernal grass. It's a decent, decent grass, semi-natural habitat. Hope that helps. Um, um, so, yeah, question time, because I know you like some questions thrown at you. And um, we had those nice palatable grasses, softer texture, and then we had the rough textured, unpalatable matte grass. Um, and that might bring, as I said here, that might, and that, that species and its credentials and stuff about it, might bring to, to mind another granuloid species. And do you have any idea which one? Maybe give you a little, not, not too long, because we can't sit here <laughs> for too long. <laughs> We've only got now. But I um, wonder if any of you might have any ideas about what is the other graminoid species that um, that, uh, that mat grass brings to mind, the mat grass and what it's all about? So Feel slightly... free to add any guesses into the chat box. Someone has said Molinia, and um, that's a pretty good answer actually. It's not. It's 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 actually not the species that I um, that I have in mind. If somebody's got it. Heathrush. <laughs> now we can move on. <laughs> Heathrush. The reason and the, the clue was, you know, because I'd said uh, there's the wording because I, I used the word graminoid 
which of course is grasses, rushes and sedges all combined, which maybe would hint that this one isn't a grass. So heath thrush is about the same size as the mat grass and just like the mat grass it's not palatable and again that's not surprising if you try and pull a bit of that stuff up out of the ground it's really tough textured its leaves are kind of wiry but they're thicker all around from side to side and top to bottom than those of um of the the mat grass and the other fine leaf grasses and they're kind of glossy and hairless um and um and it forms dense little tussocks and again, even though it's so tough in texture and unpalatable, it will give way to a lot of those softer textured species if there isn't something like grazing, usually grazing, to get in there and reduce the um, amount, the abundance of those other species, the palatable ones. So this one and the mat grass both kind of depend on an external factor coming in and, um, and, letting, and giving them more space ultimately. Um, it's a it's an easy rush to identify this one because it's got that little um, just about kind of branched little head with little brown rush type flowers on top of it. So, but the stem is very very stiff, um, and the leaves are all clustered in a rosette, a very dense rosette at the very base, and it dominates and forms um, pretty extensive swards in many places, especially higher up in the hills, and. They, uh, they have a sort of olivey um, brownish green or greenish brown color. So it's quite, uh, quite distinctive little plant. Um, and then um, we we'll might see a little bit more of this one later in some other kind of vegetation. But yeah, important species to, um, to know, I even though it's not a grass, swords dominated by the heath rush are classed within the NPMS upland grassland habitat here. Another one that we shouldn't ignore is um, bristle bent, Agrostis cotisii, fine leaves again in dense tufts, but they're a rather greyer green colour than those of the mat grass and the fescues and the wavy hair grass. Um, if anything, it looks, looks really perhaps most like the wavy hair grass with a tuft of fine leaves, um, fine wiry leaves and a head that is branched, although in that photo the, um, the branches aren't fully out yet because it's a bit earlier in the year. As with all grasses, of course, even the ones that have got branches that stick out widely, they're all generally held up close when they first come out. Um, and um, it's it's very strongly southwestern, so it's south, um, sort of south and southwest England and the extreme south of Wales, where it grows on acid soils in um, acid grasslands and also heaths, dry and some wet heaths as well. It does very well in places where there's been some burning, just like the wavy hair grass, a bit of disturbance gives it a bit of a kickstart really, and, uh, and it can become very, very abundant. So um, that one, if you're down in the, in the far southwest of the country, um, it's another fine leaved grass to bear in mind. Um, we can go on to the next page now and see as first of a few pages of some more colorful herbs that we find in these acid grasslands. Um, we do get a bit of colour. You know, things like calcareous grasslands are better known for, and, and neutral grasslands as well, for colours and herb richness, but uh, we can have quite a bit in some of these acid ones too. There's a couple of speedwells there, Germanda speedwell, and then the, the heath speedwell, which is smaller leaves, a lower growing plant generally. Um, and even smaller, the heath milkwort, that's very, very common in a lot of acid grasslands. Um, with its little slightly leathery leaves, the lower ones in opposite pairs, which distinguishes it from common milkwood, which isn't really an acid grassland plant at all. That's more in the calcareous grasslands. Bitter vetch is a nice um, plant of a lot of these acid grasslands with relatively wide leaflets um, and, um, and not that many leaflets per leaf and not that many flowers per head as well, compared to some other vetches like the, the bush vetch that has long spikes of loads of flowers. I was going to say millions of flowers, but it's not millions of flowers. And it has long leaves, loads and lots of leaflets. But this one um, has fewer in both respects, but the flowers are so nice and quite big and lush looking and the leaflets are quite broad. It doesn't need to have loads of them. And, um, Lousewort, another one, pink flowers, kind of slightly oversized looking flowers in relation to the height of the plant and the size of the leaves. And the leaves are all kind of divided up in a funny mangled cabbage like kind of way. Little um, kind of deep, deep lobing all the way along the sides. 
quite an unmistakable plant and the stems are quite thick and a bit pinkish tinged um, and um, next page has some more I'm going through these fairly quickly because I know we've only got an hour and I don't want to be um, going into all the possible kind of um, identification details for everyone otherwise we just wouldn't get through to the end in time but lesser stitchwort has typical stitchworty flowers and it's got much more slender stems and smaller leaves than the greater stitchwort that we find in woods and hedgerows um, and um, pig nuts is about the commonest umbellifer that we're ever going to find in acid grasslands if you want to neutral grasslands, then a whole lot more, especially the coarse neutral grasslands along roadsides, and you get hogweeds and cow parsley and so on, not in the acid grassland. Pig nut, it's a, it's a kind of lower grown, slender looking um, umbellifer, slender stems, and its leaves are divided up into those all equally slender, sort of narrow lobes. So quite a graceful little kind of umbellifer, very common in a lot of our um, upland acid grasslands. Commonest violet in upland acid grasslands generally is the common dog violet, which is the same species that's about the commonest one that we find lower down in woods and hedgerows. Um, but uh, you can also find mountain pansy. This is a real good upland acid grassland species because upland acid grassland is about its main habitat really. It's got really big flowers, but you know, bigger than the ones of the common dog violets, and they can be purple or yellow or a mixture of both. Beautiful plants. Um, and it's also a particularly good indicator of um, upland acid grassland that's not really had any kind of nutrient enrichment from fertilizer and so on. So always a really good find is the mountain pansy. Um, so from such nice colorful things, we can go on to the next page and a couple of dull looking herbs, um, but they're very common and we shouldn't ignore them. The, the color isn't everything. Uh, common sorrel, very common thing in um, uh, both acid and neutral grasslands. Uh, flowers kind of like those of docks because it is a kind of dock. It's in the same genus as broadleaf docks and curled docks and so on. Um, but the leaves are unmistakable. They're kind of um, oblong oval shape, but they've got those two lobes pointing backwards. Um, at the, and, and the leaf stems, leaf stalks are quite long. Um, it's edible. Both these species are edible actually, kind of acidy taste, really nice to eat. You can put them in a salad. Sheep sorrel is kind of similar, but smaller and the, the flower heads never get so tall and divided up as that one we see on the left of one of the common sorrel. Uh, and the leaves are smaller and a bit grayer tinged and what happens with the lobes at the base of the leaves of the sheep sorrel here is that they stick outwards about 90 degrees. Um, at least most of them do. Sometimes though you can find a few quite well, quite quite a number of leaves that um, that are very very kind of small and slender and they don't even have any lobes at the base and that can be a little bit confusing. They can often be of a reddish tinge as well, so there's a potential for a bit of confusion. But the fact that they're on those quite long stalks and they're um, that overly oblong oval shape. Um, will sort of hint that this species, if you've got any flower heads as well, very much more so. Um, but usually if you look around, if you've got ones without lobes, if you kind of look around the plant and for a few more plants nearby of the same stuff, it won't be long before you find some with those sort of telltale lobes that stick out at the base of the leaf. Okay, um, next picture shows wild thyme because it's, uh, you know, acid grasslands, upland acid grasslands can be occurring in quite intricate mosaics with calcareous grasslands. In fact, they occur in mosaics with calcareous grasslands rather more commonly than they do in, with, in mosaics with neutral grasslands on the whole. And they share a lot of the grass species. Um, so it's handy to know the main species to look for to tell us that it's calcareous grassland, not acid, which and that species is the wild thyme with its pink flowers this time of year and they're, they're out and it's so the calcareous grasslands in the middle of summer tend to stand out visually from a bit of a distance you can see all those pink flowers um, whereas the acid ones are more dotted with white the white of the heath bed straw um, and the yellow of the tormento 
the yellow in this case here is actually bird's foot trefoil, by the way, which is particularly it's common in acid in in sort of neutral and calcareous grasslands, but also in some of our um, acid ones as well. But all that pink of the wild thyme that means it's not an acid grassland. Um, okay, we've got now a few pages of sedges. Uh, this one, the green rib sedges, is one of the commonest sedges that we find in upland acid grasslands. It's quite a big sedge, uh, and, um, well, medium sized to fairly large. Um, the the stems, the flowering stems, can get really quite tall, and with fairly well spaced brownish coloured female spikes. But the leaves are probably more distinctive. Well, yeah, yeah, quite distinctive if they're on their own. Even if we haven't got the flowering stems, we can often tell it. So they're a kind of slightly shiny, rather darkish green, and they tend to go brownish at their tips, and there's reasonable breadth to them too. Quite a distinctive um, sedge of acid, mainly acid grasslands and acid heaths. So um, some acid woods, well, better lit parts of acid woods. That's one of the commonest. And another one that's equally common in um, acid grasslands is the next page, uh, the pill sedge. Smaller plants, yellow or green colour, and the leaves are narrower. And so we can get fairly dense little tufts of these little leaves, yellowy green leaves. That will um, tend to suggest that it's a pill sedge and be confirmed by these flowering heads, which uh, in, in which the female, both female and the male spikes, are all clustered up the tip the stem, the male one at the very tip. And the male one's quite narrow, tends to be pretty pointed, um, uh, compared with an otherwise rather similar species called spring sedge, which, um, which has a broader female. Um, a broader male, sorry, male spike at the tip of the stem, broader and blunter tipped. Also, the pill sedge stem itself tends to be a bit floppy. It can be quite long. These ones illustrated here are relatively short specimens. They can get much longer, and it's like they're, they, they haven't got enough um, stiffness to hold all the flowers at the top, so they kind of droop down, and the flowering head itself can, can often come back down to ground level sort of arching effects, whereas in the spring sedge, which grows in on more neutral to calcareous soils, by the way, it's um, a shorter and more generally upright stem with that blunter male, uh, male spike at the tip of it. So there's a couple of species that are quite similar. The pill sedge is the acid one, and the um, spring sedge, which we're not seeing here, is the more neutral to calcareous um, counterpart. Okay, next page has got another uh, sedge that's very common in a lot of acid grasslands and a lot of other acid places on wetter soils too, like Myers. Um, this is the common sedge, Carex nigra. Uh, has leaves that are quite, quite long leaves and pretty narrow, um, just uh, up to about three millimeters wide. And they go that kind of brown color in the autumn and winter. Otherwise, they have quite a greyish tinge to them, unlike the leaves of the um, pill sedge that we've just seen. And it can form quite some swards, this species, although it tends to form denser swards in wetter places um, than com compared with grasslands. Um, the flower head's quite distinctive, that kind of, mottled, kind of mottled pale green and blackish effect of the um, little scales on the fruits there alternating and the female spikes are held upright very close to the stem because they're on such incredibly short stalks or virtually unstalked and the leaves themselves tend to be upright as well. Um, the reason I point that out is because there are some other greyish tinged sedges who like um, Carex panacea, the carnation sedge and the um, uh, the Glaucus sedge, Carex flacca, whose leaves stick out, their lower leaves sticking um, out sideways um, quite a lot, and whose female spikes also stick out further because they're more stalked. This is kind of upright. Upright is the word to bear in mind, really, for common sedge, separating common sedge from those other greyish tinged sedges. So that's probably enough about common sedge for a while. The next page has actually one of those species I just mentioned, the carnation sedge, which can be quite common in some of our acid grasslands um, and, and on other kinds of soils as well, not just acid. But you can see there the, the way that those leaves are sticking out, so they come straight out of the ground and they've got to go out sideways um, to show really, to show us that three ranked pattern, they come in, in um, groups of well, there's just a sort of three ranks in a way, 
uh, which is related to the fact that sedges have, for most sedges, have stems that are triangular in section. You know, people say sedges have edges, meaning the, um, the stems are sort of triangular section stems. Um, so that's related to that. And it's got um, that particular female spike there happens to be sticking upwards, but very soon it will be um, going outwards and the lower, or any ones lower than that, likewise tend, tend to um, hang out a little bit more. And also the fruits are relatively larger and the whole spike's a bit untidy looking. Um, it likes, it generally likes kind of damper places as well. Um, so we can find that in some acid grasslands. It's very tolerant of trampling, by the way, this, this sedge. So some places where animals have trampled or people have gone through as well, a lot along footpaths, this species can, um, can do well there. Uh, okay, next page, another question. What kind of sedge are we looking at here? <laughs> Give you a minute to just um, think about that. <clears throat> I won't go for it on for very long. <laughs> it's um, this is a species of sedge that we haven't seen yet in the photos. It's the it's the spring sedge. That I was talking about earlier. See, it's got that very broad top. So uh, compared with the bill sedge, so you can think of them as like skyscrapers. Um, one of them, the bill sedge, is kind of kind of narrow and pointed like the shard. And spring sedge. Well, I've made up a cross between the gherkin and the walkie-talkie. These are London skyscrapers. With, um, I could have picked some in America as well, but. Um, I thought I'd draw some London ones. Uh, the broad top, so that's what the, the 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 spring the spring sedge you could liken to a cross between the gherkin and the walkie-talkie. Okay, um, further on, and a page of dwarf shrubs because it's not surprising on these acid soils that we might get some dwarf shrubs here and there as well. Um, given given the extent of um, dwarf shrub heath on similarly acid soils in the uplands. Um, a lot of these dwarf shrubs are very palatable to sheep and deer. So the sort of patterns that we get of grassland in some places and heath in others is partly related to grazing. Less grazed, more dwarf shrubs, more heavily grazed, fewer dwarf shrubs and more of a tendency to go to acid grassland. But yeah, we can get bits of them, heather, bell heather with its longer leaves in worlds of three and its brighter flowers. Blayberry or bilberry, um, same uh, different names, the same species, with its unmistakable green ridged stems and the leaves when they're there, they're deciduous leaves in the blayberry, but the, the um, kind of mid to yellowy green with teeth around the edges, and of course the edible fruits are unmistakable. Um, the next two on the right, cowberry and crowberry, are generally more northern upland species for the most part. Um, and they also differ in that they're not very palatable to um, uh, animals like sheep and deer and they tend to grow really pretty short and their leaves are kind of leathery and tough texture and evergreen so um, the the first three the heather bell heather and, and um, the bilberry uh, the condition of those plants their abundance if, they, if they're there their sort of height and their their condition can reveal the um, uh, some kind of um, information about how grazed the habitat is, whereas the two on the right are generally generally going to be on the short side anyway and not that browsed. Okay, um, so that's a quick run through those dwarf shrubs, um, and yeah, pe people I've mentioned that people often think calcareous grasslands are the best, or some of the neutral meadows as well, um, compared with acid grasslands, but. Acid grasslands can have not only um, you know, a scatter, at least of some of those uh, herbs that I've mentioned on the previous pages, but they can actually be there in really good quantity and great richness. Um, indeed, a, a richness that um, is pretty much on a par with what we can get in some of the good um, calcareous and neutral grasslands as well. And here, this, this is something that we find, especially on um, 
in an acid grassland where the soils appear to be maybe slightly flushed, not, not so markedly acid, but still acid enough that we have basics of a, um, an acid grassland sward. Like here, you can see the little white flowers of the wild thyme scattered in there. Um, and we're not getting the, um, sorry, sorry, the white flowers of the heath bed straw. <laughs> and, um, and we're not getting the wild thyme with its, what would be its pink flowers. So it's obviously, you can't call that a calcareous grassland. And neither are we getting things like red clover and oxide daisy in quantity to, for it to be a neutral grassland. Although we do have some bulbous buttercup in that photo that can get into some of the richer forms of um, acid grassland. But um, here there's lots of mountain pansy very good uh, acid grassland indicator species. That's one photo of some, um, one facet of species rich acid grassland. And here's another one with the whole mass of devil's bit scabious, adding some color to, to the acid grassland vegetation. It's, um, it's a species that again, it's not restricted to acid soils. It can be on fairly neutral soils as well and in a wide range of plant communities. But yeah, some of the, the richer, nutrient poor but maybe not so not hugely strongly acid um, grasslands um, they, they can um, have good populations of this uh, uh, what is what is really good in these um, acid grasslands I think is for the soils to be um, if you're wanting high species richness for the soils to be not really really strongly acid but acid enough for it to be obviously an acid grassland for generally and also not nutrient rich so kind of nutrient poor is um, a thing that tends to lead to good rich flora. Um, and the uh, next page has got some more species. A couple of species here that in themselves are rather more common in um, more calcareous places. This is the alpine bistort and the um, rock rose. Uh, quite easy things to identify. Um, alpine bistort with those little spikes of flowers that turn to um, little bulbils, the ones at the top of the spike are the little white flowers when they're in flower. Beautiful plant with um, sort of glossyish, darkish green oval leaves that have a very pale, rather bluish gray tinged underside. Um, and then the rock rose that's got flowers kind of buttercup looking in their color, but bigger than buttercup flowers in their size. and. Um, leaves a bit like oversized leaves of wild thyme because it's actually a little dwarf shrub is the rock rose but they're different from thyme leaves because they've got a groove running up the middle of the leaf and they've got little stipules at the leaf bases and they're a very pale color underneath as well. Um, a rock rose can be a very common companion to wild thyme in calcareous grasslands um, uh, so much so much so that there might be people who think that it's one of those indicators of calcareous grassland, but you also do find it in some of the slightly enriched, um, slightly flushed um, acid grasslands. Um, and, and again, the same for the alpine bistort. So they're quite choice species, those two that we can find in some rich acid grasslands. Um, next page has got uh, a view of some um, acid, some sort of species rich acid grassland as I was in actually just a few weeks ago in Perthshire. Perthshire is a great place for species rich acid grassland. Um, but there are the, these species rich acid grasslands are scattered right down south. You get them in Wales as well. The subcommunity U4C was first described um, from the more southern parts of Britain, but is also to be found here up in the north. Um, the Scottish borders is good for it as well, not for the alpine bistort. The alpine bistort is more restricted in its distribution, but um, you can see there are loads of heath bed straw, the little white flowers of it, and there's tormental in there. So if you took that alpine bistort out, it would be very much um, a, a more, a more looking like more of a run-of-the-mill acid grassland, but the alpine bistort tells us there's a bit of enrichment, a little bit of flushing coming through. Um, Next page. I just had a quick. Oh, sorry, but I just had oh, a quick yeah. question oh, being asked. Just if um, oh, yeah. if a plot is classed by MPMS, um, the map, the habitat map that we provide as grassland, uh, but there's a high number of bilberry, crowberry, and um, racemitrium moss, uh, should it be described as montane heathland instead? And um, the first thing I just really quickly 
say is um, the habitat map that we do provide is very much a guidance. They're not always 100% accurate um, because, of course, um, we can't actually know exactly the habitat type um, all across the country. Those maps um, are made. They're, they're essentially composite maps. They're estimates based on lots of data um, that's been collected uh, over the years, sort of land cover maps and whatnot. Um, so the real way to know it is, is certainly to get out on the ground and, and have a look at those species compositions. So very much use them as um, a guide um, rather than set in stone. Yeah, and if it's got um, a good extent of the bilberry and the crowberry, then um, that would be better classed as the um, as the heath. Uh, the M in fact, the NPMS heaths they say twenty five percent cover of the of the vegetation for the dwarf of, of the dwarf shrubs you know, um, to swing it into heaths. Um, so if you've got, although I tend to think generally. Um, my own kind of view is that I tend to, to refer it to be a higher percentage than that. But if, if you have got a lot of cover of those dwarf shrubs, then um, that would definitely swing it into heaths. Um, Rachimitrium lanuginosum, Rachimitrium moss, can be very common in either. So um, it, it's, uh, in fact, we'll see some photos later on that will show that it can be really abundant or even dominant in some of the vegetation that comes into the NPMS um, montane acid grassland habitat um, and it can be equally common in some of the montane heath. So it depends there on the balance between the, um, the grasses and the dwarf shrubs. Lots of dwarf shrubs then put it into the heath definitely. I'll just skip forward then. Um, I just also um, a quick note to say that um, if anybody does need to head off at two o'clock, I know this was scheduled one till two. This is being recorded. You probably will have um, seen when, when the session started. So if anybody does need to um, to run off, this is recorded and it will be put on the, the YouTube uh, channel very soon. I'd forgotten it was being recorded. I have to watch what I say. <laughs> um, but um, uh, yeah, yeah. Next picture. This this is another thing that you can get in some of the relatively rich forms of um, acid grassland, betony, uh, really in, in the southern half of Britain. It does just about get up into Scotland here and there. And in fact, that photo I took in um, Perthshire near Dunkeld, really good population of it. Um, so um, you can also find it in some neutral grasslands as well, but it does quite well in some of the species rich, relatively species rich acid grasslands. So it's very distinctive plants. If you're down south, um, you've, uh, you've got a fair chance of finding that if you're lucky enough to be in one of these um, rich acid grasslands. Um, and the next picture is one of a few pictures I've got of um, species rich mat grass grassland because the, the mat grass nada stricta it often gets a pretty bad name because people are aware that it spreads a lot where there's been very heavy grazing and some of the parts of the country where there is a lot has been a lot of heavy grazing and a dominance of mat grass um, are on soils that are very acid and very really kind of very acid and nutrient poor um, and that combined with the, the sort of really heavy grazing has been has prevented a lot of other plants from um, doing well. So it can be very herb poor and um, not much in the way of dwarf shrubs. So the kind of um, mat grass grassland often gets a bad name. However, um, you can get in some places a rather enriched form of it that has um, various other slightly more mesotrophic herbs growing within what is otherwise essentially a, an acid grassland um, kind of vegetation. And here's an example where is in um, Perthshire with some shoots of northern bed straw. You can see them growing down in the lower left part of the picture there with its leaves and quills of four. And um, there's a little bit of alpine bistort um, in, that, in, in that vegetation there. And things like meadow buttercup, very common um, species through the country as a whole and dandelion as well both very common plants but they're not the kind of things you find in most of our um, mat grass grasslands so if you do find a lot of mat grass and you see odd things like that popping up um, it's uh, added, added interest because it's um, likely to be quite a, a special enriched form of, um, of mat grass grassland which is actually not very common that kind of community 
The next picture, next page has a um, another example of that, a little bit more colourful. Um, with lots of buttercups there and more flowers of the alpine bistorts, as again in um, in Perthshire. Um, and there's another photo on the next page of um, broadly similar kind of vegetation uh, on flatter ground, lower altitude. It's uh, th this one. It looks looks kind of pretty ordinary in that kind of view because we're not looking at it close enough to see a whole load of species. Obviously, we um, we can't always look at something like that and pronounce on its um, classification without getting in there to have a bit of a closer look. Uh, and in this one, uh, there's a number of species that I've listed there at the top of the page, fen bed straw, ladies bed straw, meadow sweet water ravens, and actually you can see the marsh thistle sticking up there, um, which um, together will pull us into the more species rich form of um, acid grassland. Of course, for NPMS terms, you don't have to differentiate between the more species rich Nardus grassland and the less species rich, or between Nardus grassland and um, Agrostis fescue grassland and so on. But um, the reason I'm showing you all these pictures and, and mentioning these different kind of plant communities is to, uh, to sort of um, demonstrate really the, the great richness in a uh, great sort of range, great variety of um, mixtures of plant species that this NPMS, single NPMS fine scale habitat actually contains. They're really, really very varied. Um, so another picture coming up of something similar. Um, this one, in this picture, there's an awful lot of uh, heath thrush, Juncus squirrosus, although it's not really that obvious. The vegetation is really quite dense and there's mat grass and other grasses and sedges all growing in there. Um, it's funny, some of the heath thrush vegetation is more noticeable as a heath thrush sward. When you're looking right down into it, you can see all these rosettes. Um, but yeah, this is a sort of enriched form of heath thrush vegetation that will still come under the MPMS um, upland acid grass and fine scale habitat. Dandelion growing in there, which is otherwise not a common species in heath thrush swards, which are mainly on really more acid ground and tend to be more species poor. So it's quite a nice kind of um, plant community, this one. It's not very common. Um, okay, next page um, as uh, getting into some of the more uh, so species more characteristic of um, higher ground as well. Alcamilla alpina, the alpine lady's mantle. Very distinctive plant with these very starry looking leaves with very whitish pale undersides and edges quite unmistakable. That grows in um, some of our upland, especially more montane acid grasslands. Um, and it also actually grows in some of the upland calcareous grasslands as well. And in fact, if you were using the National Vegetation Classification, you might um, you might think of it more as an upland calcareous grassland plant because there's a whole plant community called CG11, in which that is a characteristic species growing along with wild, with, with, with quite a number of other ones. I won't mention them just yet. Um, but um, the next, in fact, the next page um, is another question because if we were in one of those places where um, it was a calcareous grassland that had a lot of alpine ladies mantle, it was a calcareous one and not an acid one as was photographed on the previous page, how would we know that it was the calcareous one and not the acid one. <laughs> Just a few seconds um, before we can move on. And um, it's the wild thyme. You'll have a lot of wild thyme growing in it if it's a calcareous one. Okay. Um, then moving on, we've got some more montane species, stiff sedge with its very stiff three angled stems on the left and the least willow on the right with leaves like labor leaves, but they're kind of rounder and more folded about the middle and there's some miniature little, um, little kind of tree in a sense, you could say. Very common in some of our really more montane acid grasslands. I'll go through these a bit quicker because I think we're starting to run a bit late. Um, the next page has got some, um, next few pages got some examples of actual um, general views of more truly montane acid grassland. Here we've got um, kind of fescue, agrostis swords, 
for, for um, fescue bent grass swords with some mat grass and paler tussocks there and um, and various mosses high up on um, on a hill in Wales there in the montane truly montane zone and the next one similar uh, with mat grass and if you get very in the higher ground where snow lies late that is one of the more natural habitats of the mat grass so here it's not depending on grazing to eliminate the other grasses snow is doing the job because a lot of those other palatable grasses are not very tolerant of long snow cover and the vegetation here grades um, up on the right onto the summit ridge uh, where it's more windy and exposed into swords of stiff sedge and rachmitrium moss which is a particular plant community that's rather well, very different and not looking very much like a grassland, but it does come into this NPMS montane acid grassland habitat type. Uh, we'll see more of that in a little while. Next picture is another grass, um, tufted hair grass, Desetrapsia sespitosa, which forms big tussocks with tall flowering stems on low ground, especially on more neutral soils, but in the montane places, especially where cold water trickles down from snowbeds, it can um, form shorter but quite dense swords mixed with montane species such as stiff sedge. So you can get a whole sort of that in, in, in um, on um, more acid soils here. So you can get heath bed straw growing mixed with the tufted hair grass. It's not that common, but it is quite widespread, especially in the Scottish Highlands, this, this plant community. OK, the next page has another high montane view of some of that mat grass again, um, a kind of snowbed mat grass sward where it's snow that's keeping the other plants at bay and a stiff sedge sward closer, the darker one. Um, snow lay, lying late on right across this hilltop in, um, in, in the East Highlands. Um, the, the stiff sedge is very tolerant of late snow. So um, it's a particular community there, the stiff sedge and some mosses. It's um, not, not that common, but we do find it quite, uh, quite commonly on some of our high plateaus. So that again comes into montane acid grassland, as does the next picture, which is mostly moss, rachmitrium moss on summit heaths um, from the Scottish Highland summits right down to those in North Wales, like Cather Idris. Um, so um, very distinctive kind of vegetation dominated by this moss uh, with scattered little bits of grasses and sedges like stiff sedge growing amongst it and some little tiny bits of dwarf shrubs as well. Um, montane, it's a montane summit community which comes into the same NPMS type. And if you, uh, the next picture is a close view of the um, rachmitrium, kind of branched stems and the leaves have long white hair points to them. Very distinctive, that gives it that greyish tinge. And the next page has um, some some um, three-leaved rush on a very high ground in the highlands. You can find this kind of slightly goldeny tinge, dense, tough, densely tufted rush, very fine leaves. Um, becoming very common, like on the Cairngorm Plateau, for example. Um, that's a high montane um, community, very high windswept places. Again, it's a rush, not a grass, but it's part of the NPMS grass, upland grassland habitat. Next page has a close view of that three-leaved rush. Beautiful little plant, with little, um, little dark browny coloured flowers, flower little clusters sort of held right close to the stems in amongst the leaves. Okay, moving on from that. Uh, bryophyte dominated snowbeds where mosses and liverworts are really, really abundant and forming kind of low crusts, some of them just over the ground, in places where snow lies really late. Um, next, the next, I've got a few pages now of examples of these. The next page has a mossy one in which the main, well, one of the main mosses is this sort of goldeny colour one you can see quite close to the front there, um, Chiaria, Chiaria starkii, growing with stiff sedge and various other um, plants, a few bits of grasses and some other mosses, but lots of Chiaria. That's, that's a kind of mossy snowbed community, quite distinctive really. The next page has um, 
uh, some more of that, the more goldeny parts on the lower left, but then the darker browny ones further up to the right and going further away are a kind of liverwort a counterpart where you get these low crusts, very thin crusts. It just looks almost like bare ground. I think a lot of people look at it and think it's just bare ground, but there's lots of tiny little liverworts forming crusts there. You get very rich assemblages of them growing with things like um, stiff sedge and the least willow. You can see the little roundy leaves of the leaf willow, the least willow in the lower right foreground of that photo. This is all very high up um, on the hills. This is, this is on Ben Law, Ben Law, this example. Okay, next picture has um, <coughs> still got some snow in it um, up in the Ben Nevis range. And again, this is a mix of the mossy and the more liverworty high montane snow beds. Um, there's lot, lots of little tiny little plants growing in these places, so it looks rather bare and like sort of disturbed ground from a bit of a distance. And of course it is disturbed by the snow getting on there and snow melt um, hydrologically. It's kind of disruption, um, freeze and thaw and so on. Okay, um, one little herb that we get on the next page in some of these places, nice little thing is starry saxifrage. Um, the distinctive little rosettes, little um, leaves, quite thick textured leaves with little teeth on them and um, five petaled white flowers. It likes wet places. So we get it in mountain springs as well, but also in some of the snow beds on acid soils. Um, the next page has a, a very common moss, Phrytidiodelphus laureus, that we see in woods and all sorts of other places, especially in upland areas, um, but common enough that people might think might not think much of it. But in the montane zone, there's a particular kind of snow bed where it's dominant mixed with um, variable amounts of stiff sedge. So it really does very well. This, this, this moss can do very well in places where snow lies for a really long time. And um, next page, we've got a, uh, some, um, a couple of pages of ferns going back down from montane to more tame sort of ground. Bracken, um, an awful lot of our stands of bracken among the hills will be within the NPMS um, montane acid grassland habitat type. Um, those that wouldn't be, would um, uh, the only exceptions would be ones that are more mixed in with woods, a lot of them that are, uh, that have a more sort of neutral to, yeah, kind of more mesotrophic kind of flora. Um, but uh, the great bulk of our acid, uh, or our bracken dominated vegetation in the hills is um, acidophilus and will be long here. Especially if, if it's growing amongst heaths and acid grasslands, then it's definitely going to be um, bracken stands that belong in this NPMS type. Um, next picture has some other kinds of ferns, lemon scented fern on the left and um, scaly male fern on the right. These can form dense um, patches of vegetation in many places too, not as extensively as bracken. Um, so um, they'll also belong in, in the same fine scale habitat, even though they're obviously not grasslands. Okay, another one um, is greater woodrush on the next page. I suppose some people might mistake it for a broad leaved grass of some kind, but it's, it's a very, a distinctive thing. This photo was taken in the autumn and it's, that's why it's a bit brownish. Um, but it kind of forms pretty dense swords, especially in places that aren't grazed very much because it's very palatable, this um, greater wood rush. So stands of that, as can be seen quite commonly in some of the less grazed uplands, they will belong in this NPMS type. And we're almost at the end, um, a page of some club mosses, which grow also in this um, in this habitat um, high up. Alpine, these ones are quite common in a lot of the higher altitude um, acid grasslands. The alpine club moss is quite creeping with those cypress looking like um, leaves, quite short and overlapping. And the fir club moss, tufted thing with longer leaves, very unmistakable club moss. Um, and the next page just has the negative indicators in this habitat, NPMS negative indicators. And, and, you know, in a lot of the ground where we get um, montane acid grass and we just wouldn't see them anyway, things like nettles and creeping thistle, if you're actually right up uh, towards or in the montane zone, you're probably not going to see them anyway. But if you do see um, lots of those species in any kind of upland acid grassland, it can suggest some kind of disturbance and eutrophication. So um, 
that's right that they should be on this negative indicator list. Um, as I'd already mentioned, the common bent in the sweet vernal grass and also the wavy hair grass. I don't know why they're classed as um, negative indicators here, but I do think they should be. Um, they're, they're quite decent ones. Um, funnily enough, I've mentioned there that there's some things that we can get in some um, acid grassland, like white clover and daisy and crested dog's tail, that if you get a lot of those in an uh, acid grassland sward, it, it can suggest there's been a bit of nutrient enrichment, um, probably from artificial treatments of some kind. So they might be potential candidates um, for negative um, indicator status. Um, okay, that's about the end of the next page, just a drawing of some um, the kind of place where you can get this um, NPMS habitat type and I hope this has been of interest and, and use to you this week or in the last pages the official last page format of the uh, the NPMS things whichever habitat we're looking at um, uh, final thank you page